Good morning, everyone. Uh, I would like to. Uh, I would like to review the instructions for the phone system and those participating by phone. Once we determine who is on the telephone, I will get every uh, everyone. Um, I will let everyone know that we will be placing those calling into the meeting in what we call lecture mode. This means that uh, from our end, we are uh, muting all callers, and once muted, they will be able to hear the meeting uh, that is in progress, but they will not be able to speak. Uh, well, they can speak, but nobody will be able to hear them here. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it is star six from our end for everyone. We, uh, we of course, will need to come out of lecture mode to uh, hear those participating uh, in the meeting by conference call and we will we, uh, and if they wish to speak uh, and vote and we will do that following presentations of reports and motions at that time um, unless callers wish to speak uh, they are to star six their telephones uh, as we have done in the past and we'll repeat this process throughout the meeting as necessary first uh, I'd like to take the uh, roll call of those who are participating in the meeting by telephone, and I have a list here. The conference is no longer in lecture mode. Starting with uh, Larry Bannock. Here, thank you. Patrick Furlong. Uh, <coughs> Patrick Furlong. M Michael Lerner. Good morning, present. Jan Richardson. Present. Uh, Harvey Strasberg. Here. Okay. Love you, Kathy. <laughs> You're in a long group of that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there anyone who is there anyone on the phone? Is there anyone on the phone whose name I have not called? Oh, there you can be, Mr. Treasurer. Uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Who is the first? Okay. Okay. Roger Yacetti. Thank you, Mr. Yacetti. And Bob Armstrong. Thank you, Mr. Armstrong. And Ms. Potter. Potter. Thank you, Ms. Potter. Brad Wright. Gordon. Thank you, Mr. Wright. George Hunter. Thank you, Mr. Hunter. Ron Mays. Thank you, Mr. Mays. Anyone else? Thank you. So we'll, we'll put the phone in lecture mode. The conference is in lecture mode. First, uh, as I mentioned in April, uh, on April the 10th, our venture colleague uh, Robert Wadden uh, was appointed to the Ontario Court of Justice on April the 8th, 2014, to fill a vacancy created uh, by that appointment. Uh, on April uh, 10th, we elected Peter Festeriga, who joins us today as a new venture. Mr. Pesterica. Peter was called to the bar in 1986 and is from Leamington, Ontario, in southwest Ontario. I'm not sure why I have to say southwest Ontario. Everybody knows where Leamington is. Peter's practice uh, focuses on civil litigation. I would like to congratulate uh, you on your elections venture and welcome you uh, to your first convocation. Uh, when we last met on April the 10th, we received the sad and shocking news of the death of the Honorable James Flaherty, PCMP, and now two weeks later it is still shocking to me. Mr. Flaherty was most notably the former Federal Finance Minister. He was, of course, also our former Attorney General, as well as an ex-officio bencher of the Law Society. Born in Lachine, Quebec in 1949, he grew up in nearby Montreal until attending Princeton University on a hockey scholarship. He then went on to study law at Osgoode Hall Law School, and after his call to the bar uh, in 1975, he practiced law for 20 years, founding Flaherty, Dow, Elliott uh, in the process before entering politics in 1995. After his re-election in 1999, he was named Attorney General, a position he held until being appointed Minister of Finance and Deputy Premier in February of 2001. Members of Convocation will recall that Mr. Flaherty was a guest of the Law Society on a number of occasions over the years, as his influence in the provincial 
and then federal governments grew. It is fair to observe that Mr. Flaherty's skill and reputation in public life grew over time to the point that on his retirement as the Federal Minister of Finance, he was recognized around the world as one of the world's most highly respected ministers of finance. Even as his stature grew both at home and abroad, he continued to connect with everyday folks with his considerable intellect and <coughs> charm. You may recall that we last hosted Mr. Flaherty at a luncheon during our Remembrance Day ceremony last November. He was in Toronto on government business and accepted our invitation, and he joined us with members of his staff. Several observations about the event stand out in my mind. First, Mr. Flaherty was completely devoid of pretension. He didn't act like the Minister of Finance. He was just Jim. Second, when I spoke to him about the Ability Centre in Whitby, Ontario, a unique charitable organization that delivers enriching sports, fitness, arts, life skills, research, and educational opportunities for people of all ages and abilities, which Mr. Flaherty and his spouse, MPP Christine Elliott, were instrumental in founding, he said to me that of all his, of his accomplishments in politics and in public life, and as we know, they were considerable, Founding, funding, and building this unique facility for able-bodied and disabled members of his community was his most satisfying and significant achievement of his public life. Finally, you may recall that on that day, Mr. Flaherty had given an emotional press conference at Toronto City Hall and came over directly to the Law Society <coughs> after that press conference. My strong sense, which I know was shared by many of you, is that on that day, the day that when he arrived here, he felt that he was among friends and colleagues. He wasn't in a hurry to leave us and lingered long after his scheduled departure time. I like to think that we gave him some small respite on a particularly tough, tough day for him. And what greater compliment can a guest give to his hosts than to want to linger a while, to continue to enjoy the hospitality and the company of friends and to rest a little before moving on. I wrote to Mr. Flaherty a letter on March 20th, and here in part is what I wrote. Mr. Flaherty, like others, I was surprised to learn of your resignation as Minister of Finance, but understand and appreciate your reasons for doing so. Even though my own public life is vastly smaller than yours, I have come to appreciate the commitment, personal sacrifices, and tremendous toll extracted from those who choose to serve their fellow citizens in public life. The commitment you have made are well known. We are very proud that we can call you one of our own. On behalf of the Law Society, I extend our thanks and gratitude. As a lawyer, you have exemplified the quali qualities of professionalism in the discharge of your duties to which, to which we can all aspire. And on a personal note, and as a parent of an adult with a mental disability, I wish also to commend you for the measures you have introduced to make the lives of persons with disabilities and their families easier to endure. You have made a direct and positive impact. I only wish that the media could have acknowledged that contribution more than they have done. Little did I know when I wrote that how soon my wish would be answered. Au nom du Conseil, je désire offrir nos plus sincères condoléances à sa famille, son épouse, la députée provinciale Christine Elliott, et leurs trois fils. Il laisse le souvenir, euh, souvenir d'avocats de première classe de Nabil politicien et d'un homme exemplaire. On behalf of Convocation, I wish to extend our deepest condolences to his family, his wife, Ontario MPP Christine Elliott, and his three sons. He leaves a legacy as a first-class lawyer, a skillful politician, and an exemplary man. On another sad note, we were also saddened to learn of the death of the Right Honourable Herb Gray on April 22nd. Mr. Gray was one of Canada's longest <coughs> serving parliamentarians and the first member of the Jewish faith to be appointed to the federal cabinet. Mr. Gray represented the people of Windsor West for nearly 40 years, making him one of the longest serving MPs in Canadian history. When he left Parliament in January 2002, he was the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada. On behalf of Convocation, I would like to extend our condolences to the Gray family and to all the people of Windsor who Mr. Gray served so well and for so long. I'd like to briefly report on a dialogue the Law Society has begun with the Real Estate Bar. The Law Society, together with Law Pro, an 
and the representatives of uh, the County and District Law Presidents Association and the Ontario Bar Association in January. And our efforts have progressed to form the Real Estate Liaison Group. Um, I have asked Ross Earnshaw, Venture Ross Earnshaw, to represent the Law Society in this group and requested that uh, he keep us appraised uh, as appropriate. I've also asked uh, Venture Alan Silverstein to participate where possible. A group is, the group is scheduled to meet in May and update and updates on its work and progress will be provided as the dialogue continues. I would note that May 1st has been announced as the day of the Ontario, that the Ontario government will table its budget. We look forward to seeing the budget as this year, um, as this year we participated directly in the pre-budget consultation, raising awareness about legal aid and eligibility cutoffs. This past Tuesday evening, I was pleased to participate in a very successful event with the Jury Review Implementation Committee that is addressing key issues in Aboriginal relations and access to justice. Former Justice uh, Frank Akabuchi helped us understand the context for his report on Aboriginal juries and speakers provided their views on whether and how progress is being made, <coughs> albeit slowly. I was pleased that we were able to host this reception and we look forward to working with them as part of our role in facilitating access to justice. Just a few upcoming events I want to remind you about. April the 28th is Holocaust Remembrance Day with keynote speakers, the Honorable uh, Rosalia Bella of the Supreme Court of Canada. On May 7th, the Law Society holds its annual general meeting, which I hope will be relatively short this year. <laughs> uh, and on May 14th, May 14th to 16th, the County and District Law Presidents Association plenary will be held in London, Ontario. May 21st is the Law Society <coughs> Awards Ceremony, and May 22nd uh, is the South, uh, the South Asian Heritage Event. I'm also very pleased that uh, the newly appointed Attorney General, the Honorable Madeleine Mayer, will be joining us for convocation lunch today. The Honorable Madeleine Mayer is the second woman to be appointed as Attorney General. Our venture colleague, Marianne Boyd, of course, was the first, but, the, but she is the first woman lawyer to be a, a Attorney General, um, which seems to be a little bit backwards, but that, that, that works. <laughs> And the first francophone, the first francophone attorney general, and that is an achievement I think that we can all all support and and uh, 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 Je suis ravi que la nouvelle procureur générale, l'honorable Madeleine Meyer, se joindra à nous au déjeuner à la Conseil. L'honorable Madeleine Meyer est non seulement la deuxième femme procureur générale, mais aussi la première avocate et première francophone procureur générale. Uh, on Ontario. Minister Mayer uh, has represented the riding of my riding, actually, of Ottawa Vanier since her election in 2003. She has held various cabinet posts, including culture, community and social services, and most recently, community safety and correctional services. Minister Mayer continues in her role as minister responsible for francophone affairs. She is also a registered nurse in addition to being a lawyer and a member of the Babo of Quebec. I look forward to having the Minister join us for Convocation Lunch today. The first order of business on our agenda is the Trinity Western University Accreditation Matter. Before we begin, I would like to briefly outline today's process. Before that, however, I would like to acknowledge the, the representatives from Trinity Western University who are joining us today in Convocation Room. <coughs> Uh, Bob Kuhn, the President and Vice Chancellor of Trinity Western University. Janet at Buckingham, uh, LLC Director and Associate Professor of Political Studies and History at Trinity Western University. And intern Braden Volknant. I'm not sure if I've got that correct. That's correct. Thank you. Uh, a, uh, an intern. And Eugene Meehan of, the, of Supreme Advocacy LLP Ottawa, Council to Trinity Western University. The representatives of TWU are the applicants in this matter and will be addressing convocation short. As you know, uh, we are webcasting convocation and uh, anyone can view our proceedings from their desktop computer. For those ventures who are following the debate by telephone and we're thinking of also watching the webcast, 
you should know there is a 60 second delay and as a result I suggest you do not try to follow the webcast or at least mute the volume when you're doing that. In addition the Lamont Learning Centre is being used here at the Law Society for lawyers, paralegals and members of the public to watch the webcast. I'd like to highlight a few points from my February statement found at tab one uh, of board books to remind convocation of the process we are following. The first convocation for the TWU matter was on, on April the 10th, gave benchers the opportunity to raise any questions or concerns they have relevant to the issues before them. The transcript of that debate is at tab five and has been provided to TWU. TWU has responded in writing to the issues and concerns raised on April the 10th and that material is found at tab 7 of board book. Following TW's presentation, I will take a speaker's list for those who wish to speak. At the end of the deliberations, we will vote in answer to the question read by the Secretary on April the 10th, and which I would ask the Secretary to read now. Thank you, Treasurer. Treasurer and Ventures, the question to be put to convocation today is as follows. Given that the Federation Approval Committee has provided preliminary approval to the Trinity Western University Law Program in accordance with processes convocation approved in 2010 respecting the national requirement and in 2011 respecting the approval of law school academic requirements, should the Law Society of Upper Canada now accredit Trinity Western University pursuant to Section 7 of Bylaw 4. The question will be read once again prior to the vote. I would like to remind benchers that for those who were not in attendance at, <coughs> April the 10th, at the April the 10th convocation, in order to vote today, you must have read the transcript of the April 10th convocation. And for all benchers, in order to vote today, you must be physically in attendance at convocation or be on the telephone for convocation for TWU's oral submissions. All of the material for today's convocation is posted on our website on the dedicated TWU page. We have also posted the equivalent of the convocation material that ventures have through their board books on our convocation page on the website. So that all page references are identical for anyone using the web version of the material. For those who wish to speak today, as I mentioned on April the 10th convocation, while I am not setting a time limit for speaking, I am asking benchers to use their best efforts to be on point and to be concise in their remarks. I will not recognize benchers to speak a second time as long as there, are, as long as there remain benchers who have not yet spoken for the first time on the speakers list. If you are recognized to speak a second time, please use the additional time for any new information uh, that you uh, may have. I will be encouraging benchers to keep any second opportunity to speak to a few minutes. I ask benchers to consider not repeating at length points that have already been made by others. We will now hear from Trinity Western University and I've agreed to uh, allow them approximately <coughs> two hours uh, for their address to convocation. Mr. Coon. My name is Bob Kuhn. With me are Eugene Meehan, TWU Ontario Legal Counsel, and Dr. Janet F. Buckingham, an internationally recognized author and speaker on the topic of religious freedom, as well as an Ontario lawyer and associate professor at Trinity Western University. Janet and one other lawyer, professor from TWU were primarily responsible for leading the development of the law school proposal which received such positive remarks from the Federation. Also with me is Braden Bolkana. He is also an alumnus of Trinity Western University, having graduated in 2013 with a bachelor's degree in business. Currently he serves as one of two president's interns and has worked with me over the past year. 
his desire is to pursue a career in law. Like his father, and ideally taken at the Trinity Western School of Law. He is asked if he can come here not just to observe the process of the Law Society of Upper Canada, but to represent Trinity Western students who wish to have the opportunity to study law at PWU, followed by the right to practice this legal career anywhere in Canada that the calling would lead. Before I begin the substance of my remarks, let me thank the Law Society of Upper Canada for the opportunity to speak. <coughs> let me thank them for the diligence which they have put into the days that we have been present and watched the debate, the material that has been read. If I could please ask uh, your forgiveness for my tremor due to the travel schedule lately, my Parkinson's disease is perhaps more noticeable than, than normal. I, I've practiced law for almost 34 years. I've had the privilege of serving a very large variety of clients, including devout religious organizations, as well as clients who are suing their churches. I've served as legal counsel for gay men and lesbian women, as well as those who would be opposed to sexual expressions of those individuals. I, like Trinity Western University, have never had a formal complaint against me on the grounds of discrimination of any kind. I am a Christian and have a faith that informs my life. The Bible is my handbook for living, and I believe it sets out God's truth. In addition to being a practicing lawyer and a Christian, I'm a graduate of Trinity Western University, and I'm currently the president of that university. Today I must speak boldly. This is the manner chosen by many benchers to whom I listened intently on April 10, and on that day neither I nor Trinity Western had the means of response. Today is our day for response. I understand that I take the potentially calamitous risk of offending some of who spoke. This is an emotive matter for many people. For Trinity Western, it is particularly important. Its community has been made to feel that its religious beliefs and Christian character are under attack. <coughs> I do not wish to make any other feel as the members of Trinity Western have over the past number of months. If I do offend, please forgive me, as I do not intend any disrespect to any person or any group. I'd like to read something that's very familiar to you. A truly free society is one which can accommodate a wide variety of beliefs, diversity of tastes and pursuits, customs and codes of conduct. Throughout the ordeals that have been faced with respect to this matter, I have often wondered whether the Canada of today is, in the words of former Chief Justice Dixon in Big M Drug Mart, a truly free society anymore. Rather, insofar as it relates to religious beliefs and codes of conduct, many times Canadian society appears unwilling to accommodate. I speak with conviction today as I am not here as a mere advocate who represents the views of another. I am a member of a community of more than 4,000 students, faculty, staff, and others. People who have been mischaracterized often, misunderstood, and unfortunately maligned through the process. Evangelical Christians are a minority in Canada, and regrettably, have become one of the final groups that it seems acceptable to vilify and make subject to hurtful comment and criticism. They have become the target of intolerance without any virtual or with, with virtual impunity. Why this is so from a sociological perspective is beside the point. Too often during this process it has been accepted that traditional Christian beliefs can be disparaged and subjected to public criticism even by those wielding government powers. 
Let me say a few things about TWU that you may not yet know. I can avow firsthand that TWU is a wonderful place. It's filled with educators and students who are vibrant and striving to make the world better for everyone. The reality of TWU bears no res the resemblance to statements and characterizations that have been made in the press, mostly by those who oppose TWU and also during convocation on April 10th. Unfortunate metaphors have been applied to the TWU community and its beliefs as set out in the community covenant. These include comparisons to racism, fascism, sexism, Muslim extremism. It uses analogies to residential schools, human rights abuses in Uganda and apartheid in South Africa. Comparisons have been drawn between the community covenant and the Chinese head tax and exclusion act, as well as racist restrictive covenants precluding the sale of land to Jewish persons. Human sacrifice, the execution of heretics, and the belief that the sun revolves around, revolves around the earth were all analogies used to denigrate the faith of my community. Not only are these analogies, metaphors, and comparisons unsupportable and inappropriate and inaccurate, they are evidence of the disregard for the beliefs of others. TWU was called hateful and bigoted which statements seem specifically designed to denigrate and vilify TWU and its religious community. Many of these statements and comparisons are more appropriate when applied to the forces that oppose Trinity Western's community and its beliefs. Given such statements, TWU <coughs> and any Christian community for that matter would rightly be concerned that it will not be treated fairly and with tolerance and with respect. Add to these metaphors and consider the words used in public response to the issues raised by Trinity Western's application to have a law school and considered in the context of these hearings. I quote, in keeping with biblical and TWU ideals, TWU should go to hell. Someone referred to Trinity Western as Taliban West. One commentator said, screw your religious delusions and your pathetic fantasy of a god. Who are these TWU wackos? Another commentator said, they can't practice their contempt, backwardness, and homophobia here. Somebody else said, the mindless collectives would be the religious ones, people who can't think for themselves, but instead subscribe to a belief system made up by a desert tribesman 2,500 years ago. This is just another example of hypo-Christian bigotry. Want to hand out law degrees in the bizarre world of fairy tales? Then practice law in the same world and keep your narrow-minded, faith-based BS away from the real world. TWU, frightened, insecure bullies, pull your head out of your Bible's ass and think for yourself. If you're religious, you suffer from a mental illness. Thump your Bible at home all you want, but keep it at home. The beliefs of racist, sexist, neo-Nazis are just as deeply held as those of the homophobes. Their beliefs are just as sincere as those of Trinity. It's no, sur no surprise that evangelical hate group, Trinity, would continue to attack gay rights, cult-like intrusion into the lives of students. Time to join the 21st century, Mr. Kuhn. Why would anyone in their right mind want to go to this outdated and bigoted school? Christianity is a cult that needs to be abandoned, and let's not stop there, but abandon all the rest of the religious cults and just start over. <coughs> this kind of idiocy, discrimination, and religious nuttery, its religion is bullshit, tied up with the Silk River. I would have second thoughts of hiring a person who had been hoodwinked their entire life into believing all that crap. Or as one lawyer put it in a Facebook post, Trinity Western University is a wacko fundamentalist Christian university with homophobic policies. But I'm encouraged by the fact that the voices for justice are increasingly drowning out the voices of bigotry and ignorance. Those are hurtful voices. Those are voices of intolerance. 
These are the words spoken without consideration of the respect or the legal rights to which Trinity Western is entitled. This is harmful language adopted by the Trinity Western Law School of Poems. Surely this kind of pejorative statement is unbecoming a member of the legal profession. A person responsible for educating our young lawyers and a person who reports to represent major firms in the country. This kind of public commentary has been and remains hurtful and harmful. And it is not just Trinity Weston that's the subject of the intolerance and inflammatory invective. Every religious person or organization which dares to hold contrary religious views to that of secular society is derided by these comments. The language impugns the importance of religion in our culture and those that live lives that are defined by their faith, some of whom have escaped faith repressive regimes only to find that they and their religious institutions are threatened again with being marginalized and driven from the public square of pluralism. Now I recognize that the issues raised in this matter are highly emotional, personal, and political. However, law societies cannot allow such unfair language used in the opposition to Trinity Western University community and its faith-based values informed and can allow that language to inform the decisions that they make under statutory authority. I'm proud that the Law Society of BC did not allow this to occur and I'm trusting the Law Society of Upper Canada to do likewise. Let it be understood. Let there be no doubt Trinity Western has done nothing to deserve the treatment it has received at the hands of those who oppose TWU and abandon legal reasoning for rhetoric. Many of these individuals are lawyers who must be committed to the safeguard of the rule of law. And of course, the Law Society requires that you maintain and advance the rule of law. This is not a battle of ideologies, philosophies, or theologies. It is a decision that must be made on the basis of the rule of law. Further, the opposition has made this a personal attack. And I don't just mean the hate mail that I've received, or the pejorative statements, some of which I can't read because of their expletives. But for example, the UBC Faculty Council proposed the Law Society of British Columbia conclude that any lawyer serving a senior position at Trinity Western University couldn't perform his professional duties ethically. That implied suggestion is that after 34 years of practice, I should be disbarred. I suspect that none of you have ever been to Trinity Western, or very few of you at best. Let me paint a picture from Trinity Western University. For contrast, and despite the uninformed conclusions of some opponents, let me describe TWU that I know. It is a community of safety where young men and women can learn, grow, be stretched, and understand and contribute to a world in need. It is a world and a place where extraordinarily gifted and caring teaching staff model rigorous scholastic excellence within the classroom and in interpersonal relationships that brings out the best in students. It is the university of the widely diverse and international student body that often experience their first truly independent decisions in this environment. It is a compassionate and service-oriented environment that focuses on positive Christian values of love and respect for all others. It is a community where the dedicated staff focus on relationships rather than rules, serving out a personal commitment to the students rather than serving economic gains. It is a place characterized by critical thinking, disciplined learning, and leadership opportunities. As a much recognized elite level championship winning sport environment, it is the envy of many schools <coughs> ten times its size, 
and the choice of top-level athletic talent from across the country and around the world. Not because they get paid, but because they chose to come to Trinity. It's a self-supporting university where, you know, tuitions are necessarily higher, but students choose to sacrifice and work very hard. Many from humble backgrounds. <coughs> Many who win, like me, with $300 in their pocket and worked solidly part-time all the way through school and took out loans in order to have the kind of education that we felt was important. But most of all, it's a Christian educational community that a chorus of 24,000 alumni and current students almost invariably say, I love this place. Show me a university that has that effect on people. It's not a university of bigotry or a university of intolerance or a university that's characterized with the most negative terms possible. It's a university that students leave <coughs> saying, I love this place. The caricatures that have been created by the inferences or expressed references of many of those who oppose Trinity Western's law school are simply unjustified. And they're based on ignorance of the facts in many cases. These comments lack balance and seem intended to defame or demean the character and competence of my community of learning. The facts, the facts and the evidence before you are clear. Trinity Western has a 52-year-old unblemished history of excellence in every respect. It's a Christian university by reason of its statutory mandate, its charter to offer university education with an underlying philosophy and viewpoint that is Christian. It is a growing faith-based educational community that offers 42 undergraduate degrees and 17 graduate programs. It has achieved recognition for academic excellence, having attained an unprecedented and unequaled A-plus rating seven years in a row with the Global Mail University Report Card. The National Survey of Student Engagement and the Canadian University Survey Consortium consistently rank Trinity Western among the top universities in Canada for educational experience. <coughs> Trinity offers often oversubscribed professional degree programs like nursing and education, as well as professional postgraduate programs in business, leadership, counseling, psychology. <coughs> Trinity Western has been in good standing with the Association of University of Colleges in Canada for 30 years. Trinity Western's experience, students' experience, an extraordinarily high level of community involvement. 57% of undergraduates are involved in community involvement. This involvement includes working with the disadvantaged, the homeless, the members of the sex trade in the downtown east side of Vancouver, all the way to international relief efforts around the world in Africa, Asia, Eastern Europe, Central and South America. This is unmatched by any secular university of any size in Canada and represents Trinity's reaching out and serving the local and international needs that our humanity faces. As the Supreme Court of Canada said in the Trinity Western University decision in 2001, there is no rational argument that such a religious educational institution is somehow against the public interest. And that was said in the context of a community covenant very similar to what we face today. And as a matter of public record, TWU has gay and lesbian students, a number of which have openly responded over the last few months to media requests for interviews. There is no evidence of gay bashing. The evidence is quite to the contrary. 
in summary on the definition of who Trinity Western actually is. It's a broad-based, open learning environment which encourages critical thinking and analysis, not just of ideas that threaten its Christian worldview, but the very Christian worldview from which it gains its perspective. Arguably, and having been educated in both the secular university environment and the Trinity, I can parrot this, this or I can echo this comment. Arguably, the Trinity Western learning environmental environment enables a broader community dialogue, which is greater than that permitted at public universities, which eschew and often denigrate any perspective that comes from religion. Evidence of that discriminatory view can be found in the anti-Christian rhetoric used by academics during this very process. What is the path that has brought us here? I have thought long and hard about the circumstances in which we find ourselves. It all started rather innocently enough. The university decided to act upon its long-held desire to add a school of law to its flourishing professional schools and programs. It consulted with a large number of people regarding the startup of the law school. That included law deans, legal academics, law society leadership, bar association leadership, government ministries, and other lawyers. No one, no one expressed opposition. So we proceeded. After many years of planning, consultation, and preparatory work, TWU submitted a proposal to the Federation and the BC Government Ministry of Advanced Education, June 2012. As you know, the Federation undertook a rigorous 18-month process of applying the National Congress rules, requirements, and agreed, uh, requirements that are agreed by all law societies, including the Law Society of Upper Canada. And in December of 2013, the Federation concluded that Trinity Western proposal was comprehensive and designed to ensure that students acquire each competency included in the national requirement. Included in their analysis was the Community Covenant, the document which has gathered so much attention through these proceedings. And the Federation concluded that that covenant was not a deficiency in the proposal. <coughs> Recognition must be made of the Federation's Special Advisory Committee struck to specifically consider the opposition that had been mounted to the Community Covenant and the Christian character of TWU. A well-respected group of objective legal counsel, including a former Law Society of Upper Canada Treasurer, was formed. And in concluding its deliberations after considering all the applicable legal and public interest issues, as well as the legal opinions of an eminent Ontario-based legal counsel, John Laskin, the Special Advisory Committee stated, there will be no public interest reason to exclude future graduates of the program from law society bar admission programs. There will be no public interest reason to exclude future graduates of the program from law society bar admission programs. Of course, this includes future graduates of Trinity Western who sought Law Society bar admission in Ontario. At the same time, the DC Ministry of Advanced Education took a similar period of 18 months of rigorous assessment, including an analysis by an expert evidence review panel comprising of approximate of existing university law school faculty, including four former law school deans. This process included consideration of the community covenant and resulted in approval in mid-December 2013. On April 11, 2014, after reviewing approximately 300 submissions of at least half a dozen legal opinions and other relevant material, the ventures of the Law Society of British Columbia concluded that there was no legal or public interest reason to disprove disapprove Trinity Western's Law School. That's the home jurisdiction of Trinity Western speaking. People that know the institution, its students, its faculty and staff best 
and the province that will inevitably be most impacted by Trinity Western's law school graduates. They voted overwhelmingly in favor of the Trinity Western Law School proposal. They expressly did so not because they agreed with the sincerity, sincerely held religious views that are recognized in Trinity Western's community covenant, but because they rose above their personal views and made a decision based on the law. So what's at stake? What's the decision here? What's at stake here today is the critically important question, does an evangelical Christian educational community, Trinity Western University and its members, have freedom of religion such that a law school, its law school graduates will be permitted to practice law in Ontario? Is there a willingness, in the words of former Chief Justice Dixon, to accommodate Trinity Western's code of conduct, definition of marriage, and the religious beliefs upon which they are based. This is not an issue of discrimination against anyone except those <coughs> students who may, five years from now, apply to practice law in Ontario. Opponents of TWU's law school would have you judge those students as being inadequately prepared to practice law in this province. They would have you bar the door regardless of their personal qualifications. And why would they condemn those young lawyers? Because they attended a law school that maintained the traditional religious definition of marriage as being between one man and one woman. <clears throat> a belief that's protected by law and is still widely held in Canada. To bar entry to the practice of law in Ontario on such a basis constitutes, in my opinion, prejudice. Prejudice is defined as an opinion formed beforehand, especially an unfavorable one based on inadequate facts. A decision formed five years ahead of any actual students making this application, formed on the basis of inadequate facts about those students. The irony of the situation is that the assault on this small Christian community is being led by a powerful moral majority who seek to impose their views and enforce conformity and compliance on TWU as a price for entering the public arena, which is overwhelmingly dominated by public institutions. <coughs> there is no meaningful discussion of accommodation of religious views. There is no meaningful consideration being given to the harm done to my religious community. Rarely does Trinity's opposition make any attempt to balance competing interests. And given the Supreme Court of Canada's direction as to how such competing interests should be analyzed on indistinguishable facts, this is most surprising. As a religious community, TWU has done nothing improper, <coughs> illegal, or immoral. If the opponents to Trinity Western's law school are permitted to impose their value judgments on the minority as proposed, then religious communities, organizations, and individuals who dare to maintain their religious principles will be excluded from public full participation in our pluralistic society. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would be a travesty in a free and democratic society which is committed to pluralism, diversity, and mutual respect. Now what's the document that we're actually talking about? It's the Community Covenant. Please recognize this is critical for everyone to have reviewed the complete documentation related to the application and the approval, but specifically the Community Covenant. And looking at it in context, I'm going to read from a portion of that to make sure that the context is at least before you. Now it's a five page document. And I'm sure most of you it have can be, the, the, the document can be found at tab 3.3.5 of the top board book. Uh, that would be, I believe it's page, uh, 
2094. Trinity Western University is a Christian university on the, of the liberal arts, sciences, and professional studies with a vision for developing people of high competence and exemplary character who distinguish themselves as leaders in the marketplaces of life. Harvey Contour, Harvey Tesco. The university's mission, core values, curriculum, and community life are formed by a firm commitment to the person and work of Jesus Christ as declared in the Bible. This identity and allegiance shapes an educational community in which members pursue truth and excellence with grace and diligence, treat people and ideas with charity and respect, think critically and constructively about complex issues and willingly respond to the world's most profound needs and greatest opportunities. The university is an interrelated academic community rooted in the evangelical Protestant tradition, and it is made up of Christian administrators, faculty, and staff who, along with students, choose to study at TWU, covenant together, and form a community that strives to live according to biblical precepts believing that this will optimize the university's capacity to fulfill its mission and achieve its aspirations. I would stop there to say, we believe that's been done and continues to be done. The Community Covenant is a solemn pledge in which members place themselves under obligations on the part of the institution to its members and the members to the institution and the members to one another in making this pledge, members enter into a contractual agreement and a relational bond. By doing so, members accept reciprocal benefits and mutual responsibilities and strive to achieve respectful and purposeful unity that aims for the advancement of all, recognizing the diversity of viewpoints, life journeys, stages of maturity, and roles within the PW community. It is a vital <coughs> that it is vital that each person who accepts the invitation to become a member of the TWD community carefully considers and sincerely embraces this community covenant. Over the page, it talks about the biblical foundation that inspires TWD to be a distinctly Christian university in which members and others observe and experience truth, compassion, reconciliation, and hope. TW envisions itself to be a community where members demonstrate concern for the well-being of others, where vigorous intellectual learning occurs in the context of whole person's life, <coughs> where members give priority to spiritual formation, and where service-oriented citizenship is modeled. Under community life, TW community covenant involves a commitment on the part of all members to embody attitudes and to practice actions identified as in the Bible as virtues and to avoid those portrayed as destructive. Members of the TWU community therefore commit themselves to cultivate Christian virtues set out there, live exemplary lives characterized by honesty and so on, communicate in ways that build others up according to their needs for the benefit of all, and treat all persons with respect and dignity and uphold their God-given worth from conception to death. Now, at the bottom of the page, in keeping with biblical and PWU ideals, community members voluntarily abstain from the following actions. Communication that is destructive to TWU community life and interpersonal relationships, including gossip, slander, vulgar obscene language, and prejudice. Harassment of any form, verbal or physical intimidation, including hazing, lying, cheating, or other forms of dishonesty, including plagiarism, stealing, misusing, and destroying property belonging to others. And most operative, it seems, for some, sexual intimacy that violates the sacredness of marriage between a man and a woman. It is those values and others that are, that are reflected in the community covenant 
is a community covenant that apart from a few items in it would be the desire of every institution of advanced <coughs> in this country. And in fact, we have been asked, how do you avoid some of the things that have occurred on the campuses of this country? Where underage rape is seemingly acceptable. Where discipline and consequences are immaterial in many cases. To the bottom of the page, the university is committed to promoting and supporting habits of healthy self-care. And it goes on to talk about <coughs> positive living. <coughs> it talks about drug and alcohol, tobacco use, entertainment, which is of questionable value. And it ends, or close to ends, with a statement. TWU welcomes all students who qualify for admission, recognizing that not, not all affirm the theological views that are vital to the university's Christian identity. Students sign this covenant with the commitment to abide by the expectations contained within the community covenant and by the campus policies published in the academic calendar and student handbook. It is, if nothing else, a manifesto of positive living. It is what I've been told by a number of presidents of public universities, a fantastic place to start with their own need to control the kind of activities that occur on student campuses. It expresses the historical and spiritual definition of our community. It's a community that has an untarnished record of academic freedom and compliance with human rights legislation spanning more than 50 years. As proof positive of that untarnished record, the Law Society of British Columbia actively sought evidence from true university records in British Columbia, other universities, including law schools, and from its own records of complaints at the Law Society in order to determine whether there was any objective evidence of TWU graduates being guilty of discriminatory behavior. They checked with the nurses. They checked with the teachers. They checked with the Human Rights Commission. Not a single formal complaint has been lodged. Not a single scrap of evidence has been produced to indicate that anyone from Trinity Western Anyone who's graduated or even gone there has been guilty of discriminatory behavior. There is no evidence of discrimination. In fact, it's interesting, some of the letters in response, including the University of Victoria, said they had nothing but approval for Trinity Western grads, mm -hmm. including one who had graduated just recently with the gold medal from that school. I should add that months ago, Trinity Western offered freely and agreed with the BC branch of the Canadian Bar Association to encourage TWU law school students to become members of the CBA. And in consideration of them becoming or choosing to become members, Trinity would pay their memberships. In addition, Trinity Western offered, without being asked, to invite the BC branch of the CBA to hold a session on TW's campus led by SOGIC or any other comparable section of the Canadian Bar Association for the purpose of identifying and presenting legal issues related to the LGBT community. So what exactly is so contentious? First, I want to start by saying the student body is diverse in every way. Second, the offending language focuses on two things, behavior and belief. With respect to behavior, PWU students, faculty, and staff agree to abstain from sexual intimacy. This is applicable to the sexual activity on both, of both heterosexuals and homosexuals. 
And while some have suggested that this limits a person's sexual identity, there is no law to suggest that a religious community cannot constrain sexual behavior in accordance with re religious principles. As we pointed out in the written submissions, the Supreme Court of Canada in Wartcock specifically stated that conduct and status are not conflated for, purpose, for all purposes. Virginity before marriage and celibacy outside of marriage constitute such a religious principle in PWU. It is not a widely recognized societal value. But marriage is very important in the Christian context. It's a sacred state. And it's not limited to the civil definition. And as is clear from the Civil Marriage Act, Section 3.1, the drafters of that legislation made it absolutely certain that religious organizations would be neither penalized nor refused benefits as a result of taking a definition of marriage that they held as religiously and as faith-based as this Trinity. Now with respect to beliefs, the objection of those opposing Trinity Western's Law School comes down to two quite simple questions. Can the community that is Trinity Western University in accordance with evangelical Christian beliefs and as a means of defining its religious community subscribe to a definition of marriage that is limited to being between one man and one woman? The answer to that question 10 years ago would have been, of course. Few, if any, would disagree with the answer being yes. Today, they're entitled to hold that view. It, it, it's, it's incontrovertible that the view was part of the historical, traditional belief of the church. How could anything in society dictate otherwise? The second point is that given the religious definition of marriage acceptable to DWU that does not include same-sex marriages, does that belief-based fact constitute unlawful discrimination against same-sex married couples, such as to preclude Trinity Western University from having a law school that graduates men and women who may article in Ontario? Simply put, can the Law Society of Upper Canada discriminate against TWU and its students because TWU holds the belief that when constituting agreed terms of membership in its community, Christian marriage does not include same-sex married couples? And I'd like you to think about who's being harmed here. Is it an undefined, unidentified couple involved in a same-sex marriage who might apply to Trinity Western Law School, but is insisting that only if the six offending words in the community covenant were deleted? Or is it the Trinity Western community, which is being pressured into abandoning its beliefs about human sexuality and the sacred state of marriage? Look at the recent legal action in British Columbia. It's not just attacking TWU's definition of marriage, it's claiming that TWU must accept same-sex common law relationships as part of its community as well. It goes even further to suggest that TWU cannot refuse to accept the beliefs of some Christians who have adopted newer standards applicable to the definition of marriage based on their own biblical interpretation. Where does it stop? Doesn't each religious community get to determine the religious views and moral standards to which they have historically held to be true. Or are we going to have someone dictate what is acceptable in the public sphere? It's troubling to me, as I'm sure it would be troubling to you, to hear direct reports from universities in some of the, in some of the cities in, in Ontario make public statements that they will not be satisfied until Trinity Western is shut down. 
So the significance of this process, without exaggeration, literally, literally millions of people of religious faith in Canada, and indeed elsewhere, will be watching the Law Society of Upper Canada and these proceedings. They will all be asking in one way or another one question. Is there still meaningful freedom of religion in Canada? Is there still a place for me and my church in this country? I'm sure you recognize the process that we've embarked upon in this matter is both in this matter is both unprecedented and unpredictable. The process itself puts Trinity Western on trial. Trinity Western has done everything required of it. It obtained the necessary BC government and federation approvals after arduous and lengthy argument, uh, examination of all the materials and submissions. The same parties that are currently arguing the same points here were involved there. The necessary approvals required and received were careful and comprehensive analysis of a large volume of material, answering all the required questions over a lengthy period of time, including concerns about public interest. In my submission, it appears to be the goal of the current process to seek a means by which to remove the benefit to which TWU has become entitled. It is to anticipate, <coughs> anticipate after the fact legislation intended to prevent Trinity Western from graduating law students who are acceptable to practice law in the province of Ontario. To compound the unfairness of this process and potential conclusion, any judgment about Trinity Western's graduates constitutes prejudgment five years hence regarding the ability of those yet unknown graduates of the future to practice law in Ontario in an ethical and professional manner. And it seeks to do that on the basis of no evidence other contrary. How can the Law Society of Upper Canada possibly make such a decision? Such a conclusion would necessitate a finding based on a graduate's disqualification due to his or her faith, or a disqualification based on faith-based principles of the law school that he or she amend, uh, attended, even if that graduate didn't agree with them. There are a number of reasons why Trinity Western's law schools should have, or Trinity Western should have its law school. There is no sustainable, logical, or legal basis upon which the Law Society of Upper Canada should deny future graduates of Trinity Western Law School the right to practice law in Ontario. This is not a question of the majority having to agree with the religious beliefs sincerely held by a religious educational community. Trinity Western asks only that its religious beliefs be tolerated as part of a pluralistic society that encourages diversity. The Law Society of Upper Canada should not engage in any determination, opinion, or position on the validity or acceptability of religious tenets or beliefs. This would be effectively to create a faith test as a prerequisite for practicing law here. Assuming that the Law Society of Upper Canada does not intend to investigate or disqualify religious lawyers whose beliefs may differ from those of the secular society, the Law Society should extend the same tolerance and understanding of TWU's School of Law graduates, provided they display professional competence and ethical behavior. Certainly, it would appear to be no impediment in Ontario that, limited accept that limits acceptance of others who qualify as law students from American or international law schools without regard as to whether those law schools have a faith-based code of conduct similar to the one that's received such scrutiny in these proceedings. In order to frame my concluding remarks, I wish to read portions of an opinion of the BC Civil Liberties Association. Opinion, which was delivered as part of our initial submissions. And it will be very short. The last page reads, Conclusion, we submit that the Law Society, and I'll use BC because in my view there's no lack of comparability in the conclusions raised in the Civil Liberties Association uh, opinion. The Law Society of BC should, in accordance with the Federation's decision, approve Trinity Western's application for accreditation. The question is not whether the ventures individually or as a group agree with TLU's covenant 
or choose to abide by it themselves. The question is whether the acceptance by law students attending TWU of the Community Covenant should bar Trinity Western graduates from joining the ranks of the legal profession in British Columbia, and I would say Ontario. Our commitment to a society in which LGBTQ people are free from unlawful discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation does not give us a license to discriminate against others on the basis of their consciously, conscientiously held religious beliefs, not to deny them their fundamental freedoms. There is no basis for believing that accreditation of TWU's law school will lead to anything unlawfully unlawful in terms of discrimination against LGBTQ people or would otherwise be contrary to the public interest. To the contrary, for the Law Society to deny TWU's application for accreditation would itself be contrary to law as established by the Supreme Court of Canada and would result in unlawful discrimination against and infringement of the fundamental freedoms of those who seek only to be able to study law and be allowed entry into the legal profession without discrimination based on their religious beliefs. In my submission, there cannot be a more objective opinion expressed than that of the Civil Liberties Association. I must admit that I find this all very strange. Let me summarize. Both the BC government and the Federation of Law Societies have spent years developing appropriate assessment systems and expertise to evaluate educational programs. In the case of the Federation, it was created to act effectively as agent to law societies. Trinity Western submitted its law school program to the arduous process of applying to the BC government and the Federation, both of whom are highly qualified to assess such programs. Trinity only proceeds after considerable due diligence with other law schools, BC Law Society, bar associations, lawyers, judges, legal academics, politicians, and others, without any indication of objection from any of them. Objective experts acting on behalf of both the BC government and the Federation scrutinized TWU's application for over 18 months. And during that time, a significant number of complaints made their views known to both government and Federation, making the same arguments as they do now all such arguments assessed and responded to in detail. And after due consideration, approval of Trinity Western's law school was granted by the Federation, which is with its reasoning supported in detailed form and appropriate follow-up assessments being required. Subsequent to the Federation's approval of BC government, Ministry of Advanced Education came to the same conclusion as did the Federation and approved the law school program's appropriate follow-up assessments required. The careful process and approval reasoning of both the BC government and the Federation have not been shown to be an error. The Law Society of British Columbia voted 20 to 6 to approve the Trinity Western Law School located within its own jurisdiction. But now, the Law Society of Upper Canada is petitioned by the same parties who had complained and made submissions to the Federation. Those submissions were heard. Those complaints are urging the Law Society of Upper Canada to ignore or discard the national approval process and the conclusions arrived at, supplementing its own views in place of the Federation's conclusions. The Law Society of Upper Canada is being pressed to conclude without any evidence whatsoever that five years from now, a small new law school on the west coast of Canada will produce graduates, some of whom may seek to work as lawyers in Ontario but are otherwise unacceptable. These graduates are preemptively to be excluded from the ranks of the legal fraternity of Ontario because of the religious views held by the university they attend. <coughs> Neither the Law Society of Upper Canada nor the Federation's NCA currently inquire into the faith or beliefs of any person applying to be a member, nor does it exclude potential membership where an education has been received in a university with comparable religious values to that of Trinity Western University. The Law Society of Upper Canada is being pressured to refuse graduates from Trinity Western's law school because of the complaints, the four or rather six words in the covenant. These six words reflect important and sincerely held religious views, not just of the community known as Trinity Western University, but millions of other religious people. 
These six words are protected by both legislation and the decision of the highest court in the land. In both legislation and court decisions, <coughs> it has been determined that these words of religious conviction are not to be contrary, not to be considered contrary to the public interest, but are part of the religious freedom of those who use them. Those six words, between a man and a woman. But let's face it, that's really not what it's about. It's not about six words. It's about accommodating, about tolerating the religious views of my community. Views that differ from the majority. It is about men and women who wish to have the freedom to participate fully in society without penalty or loss of benefit due to those religious views. Let me share my expectations of a future based on what your disapproval of anyone educated at Trinity Western University Law School might look like. If you disapprove, your decision will have validated the vitriolic, verbal, and written attacks made against my community. Your decision will have endorsed institutional bullying, whereby powerful organizations have, without warning or justification, threatened and, in fact, carried out the imposition of their moral judgments on my religious community. You will have set yourselves up as a court of appeal over the conclusions of qualified and objective bodies whose mandate it was to carefully assess and judge the sufficiency of the law school proposal put forward by my university. Your decision will have eroded, if not eliminated, the uniform national requirements and function of the Federation in relation to approval of law school. Your decision will be the first jurisdiction to refuse approval of the TWU Law School, thereby creating the beginning of a potential patchwork quilt of confusion and inconsistency. Your decision will be inconsistent with that of British Columbia, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Prince Edward Island, Newfoundland, Labrador, and none of it. Mobility rights will obligate the Society of Upper Canada, Law Society of Upper Canada to accept TWU graduates in any event. Your decision will have discarded the diligence of the BC Ministry of Advanced Education, the Federation of Law Society of Canada, and the Law Society of British Columbia, not to mention the extraordinary efforts of my community. Your decision will have thrown your weight in with the popular opinion of the day, thereby approving the diversity destruction by the moral majoritarian view that marginalizes anyone who would disagree. Your decision will have the related or have relegated freedom of religion to a subservient position and ironically given so-called equality rights a trump card. Your decision, contrary to virtually every reason and impartial reason and impartial legal opinion submitted on this question, will have unilaterally set aside a 13-year-old judgment of the Supreme Court of Canada despite an eight to one decision that involved the same university with virtually the same community covenant, opposed by virtually the same parties, making the same arguments. Your decision will have communicated to millions of Canadians that because of their religious views, they are not welcome in the public marketplace, thus threatening the very premise of a pluralistic society in Canada. Your decision will have prejudged the adequacy of TWU law school students who graduate five years from now, having determined that they are either inadequate in some undefined and unproven way, or are guilty by association, or by reason of their faith. Your decision will have sullied the 50-year unblemished reputation of my institution of learning, challenging its value and its very existence, and aligned the Law Society of Upper Canada with the intolerance of secularism. But perhaps most important, your decision will not serve or protect the public interest at all. It will rather reduce the public interest to a tool of political conformity and punishment. I've spoken frankly, and perhaps in my passion to protect my community, I may have overstepped. If I have done so, it is because I fear that a great injustice may be perpetrated upon my community, my university, my faith, and those who share it. I submit that there is no legal 
or logical basis for the Law Society of Upper Canada to refuse to accept future Trinity Western Law School graduates seeking to work in the legal profession in Ontario. I urge you to decide this matter in a manner consistent with the rule of law and every other authority that has considered the fate of Trinity Western University's law school. And I commend that decision to you in the good faith that you will see your task as upholding the rule of law and upholding the place of religious freedom in this country. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coon. Uh, is there any other representative of TWU that's going to speak to the matter, Mr. Coon? No, sir. We're going to take the morning break.